it would be, and I saw the time stamp. We're supposed to start our AGM at 1.45. So which means that 5, 10, 15, 20. That means I got 25 minutes to preach. Do you, that's not even my introduction. That's half my introduction. Okay, so got the best compliment from Pastor Marcia this morning. She said, she said to me, I think, she said, Pastor Mark, he, he, he's an African preacher. He just doesn't know it. My assumption was that they preach for like a half, an hour and a half in Africa, which is, yeah. So I'm going to say to you right now, a lot of what I'm going to share with you, I'm going to read because I have that time constraint. But I'm also going to tell you this. I don't think I'm going to be done by quarter two, just to let you know, okay? But here we go. So today we come together for the first time after we heard the announcement from Pastor Marcia. I don't know if some of you may have heard it today for the first time when she had that slide of Beth and myself up there. And we've had a, a week to sit with it, to think about it, to react to it, and feel the weight of it. But one night early this week, or last week, I believe that the Lord gave some insight to my wife, Beth, and uh, myself regarding what is really unfolding in our spiritual family. And it's helped us to understand the season that we are leaving and the new season that we're entering. So today, I want to share that perspective with all of you. Today, I want, you to help you, I want to help you understand why this is a season to rejoice. And I do hope and pray that you'll have a deeper understanding of what it means to believe that the joy of the Lord is my strength. So say this with me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Ready? The joy of the Lord is my strength. Say it one more time. The joy of the Lord is my... Okay. So not very convincing because you're sitting there. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Wow. Wow. Okay, so I want you to do, do this with me. We're going to put some movement into it because do you know that your physiology affects your feelings? Right? So if you're just sitting there, your shoulders are a little slump, you're not sitting straight, and you're kind of just like, the joy of the Lord is my strength. It affects how you are. How, it affects how you feel. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to do this, and I have to put the microphone down. So sorry to the sound guys. Sorry for those of you who are watching on Zoom. I'm going to put the mic down. Just for a moment. And I want everybody here in the congregation to do this. I want you to do this. I want you to go. Oops, let, me, let me stand there. Wait. Sorry. I'll stay here. I'll stay here. I want you to go. Okay. I want you to go. Joy. Say joy. Okay. Joy. And then do this. Strength. All right. So joy. Strength. Do it again. Joy. Strength. Joy. Strength. So every time you say the word joy, and every time you say the word strength, again, joy, strength. Let's practice this together. Let's say that verse. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Do it again. The joy of the Lord is my strength. All right. That's better than, that's better than coffee, ladies and gentlemen. That's better than coffee. All right. Now, as I read this next passage of Scripture, I want you to see this as a cold open, what's called a cold open. And a cold open is a term they use in the television industry that kicks off the episode with either a problem that is like an unsolved murder or an unusual situation like the heroes of the, of the series, you know, facing an immediate dilemma like being accused of a crime. Sometimes shows open a, with a, showing a time frame later in the story, and then they flash back. The rest of the episode is a flashback to what happened leading up to that moment. So here we go. It's going to come from Nehemiah chapter 8. This is what the Lord showed Beth and myself this week. Nehemiah chapter 8. We're going to have it up here on there as well. If you open your Bibles, you can also follow along. And we're going to look at the cold open, the scene, verses 9 and 10 of chapter 8, which says, And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep, for all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, and drink sweet wine, and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved. 
for the joy of the Lord is your strength. My, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is verse 10, because it says, eat the fat and drink the sweet. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So for those of you who are vegan or vegetarian, or it's biblical. Biblical. Okay. Eat the fat and drink the sweet. Don't meddle. My wife is telling me to behave. Okay. And so, and this is the, where we find this phrase. Don't be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength. So here's the question. What happened? What happened here? Why is Nehemiah comforting a mourning and weeping community with the words, do not be grieved for the joy of the Lord is your strength? I mean, this was not a, the scene of a tragedy. This was not the loss of a high-stake athletic championship, nor was it the loss of a loved one. In fact, it was supposed to be a time of joy, and yet the people were weeping and mourning. What happened? See, the Jewish people were exiled in Babylon as a consequence of their disobedience to God and their violation of the covenant between God and the Israelites. The prophets, these particular prophets, Nahum, Zephaniah, Habakkuk, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, you find them in the Old Testament part of your Bible. All of these prophets lived around the same time, within that 70-year period, and, and prophesied to the people. They repeatedly warned the Israelites against idolatry, social injustice, and moral decay, and urged them to repent and return to the Lord. However, they stubbornly continued in their obedience, disobedience, sorry, leading to their eventual defeat. Now, in 586 BC, the Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar II, besieged, that really is his name, by the way, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, Nebuchadnezzar II, not one, two, junior. Besieged Jerusalem, yeah, Nebi, destroyed the city and its temple and deported a significant portion of the population to Babylon. So Jews being deported, conquered and then deported to Babylon, and that lasted for 70 years. That's known as the Babylonian captivity in biblical history. The story of Nehemiah, the, the book that we're looking into, begins with Nehemiah serving as a cupbearer to the king of Persia. This time, his name is Artaxerxes I. Now, who is Artaxerxes? Funny names, right? Funny names. You have to go to school just to learn how to pronounce the names. But here he is. This guy, who is this guy? Artaxerxes? Yep. This guy was the third son of Xerxes I. Right? Because he is, yeah. His name is Artaxerxes I. Third son of Xerxes I. Who was Xerxes I? Xerxes I is this guy. This is the Persian king that the Spartans fought against in the movie 300. If you ever saw the movie 300? No, of course not. But most of the guys probably saw it, right? 300? So this is the guy, okay? He's the dad. And now Nehemiah is dealing with the third son of this guy, okay? Nehemiah got the news of the broken down state of Jerusalem's walls and gates, which lay in ruins, leaving the city vulnerable. And Nehemiah, deeply troubled by this, asked permission from the king, from Artaxerxes, to return to Jerusalem and rebuild the walls, basically restore his beloved city. And the king grants his request and provides Nehemiah with resources and authority to carry out the task. Go, go ahead and do it. And when he arrived in Jerusalem, Nehemiah assessed the situation and called and rallied the people to join him in the reconstruction of the city of Jerusalem. But he faced opposition from the neighboring enemies. So Nehemiah and his fellow workers, they persevered. They, they, they prayed, they were vigilant, they did strategic planning, and they rebuilt the walls section by section. And it says each family contributing to the labor while guarding against the threats. In other words, some... Some people stood guard and they had weapons to guard everybody else who was working. But the others who were working on the wall, they would work with one hand free so that they could be putting the bricks up and everything. The other hand had a sword just in case. So they would build and they'd have to protect at the same time. Okay? Others, they need, when they needed two hands, they'd always have a sword right beside them on their belt. And um, this is how they rebuilt the, the wall in 52 days. Now, meanwhile, while all this was happening, Ezra, and we, he has a book too, Ezra and Nehemiah, right beside each other in the Old Testament. He's a scribe and he's a priest. 
he leads another crucial aspect of the restoration, the renewal of worship and obedience to the Mosaic law. Ezra made sure that spiritual revival coincided with the physical reconstruction that were being efforted by Nehemiah. Do you see the partnership between Ezra and Nehemiah? Ezra made sure the spiritual vitality of the people was restored, while, uh, while Nehemiah restored the physical boundaries of the city. The completion of the wall and the reestablishment of the temple demonstrated not only the physical restoration of Jerusalem, but also the spiritual renewal of the Jewish people. The partnership of Nehemiah and Ezra, a marketplace leader, that's Nehemiah, and a religious leader, demonstrates the importance of leadership, faith, and collaboration in extremely difficult times. Together, they inspired the people to overcome obstacles and rebuild their homeland. Does this story sound familiar, MVC? This story of restoration? This story of rebuilding? Now, it's in the context of this incredible story of restoration and renewal that we return to our cold open. Except we're not going to go all the way back there. We're just going to take parts of it where we, up until we get to the part where it says, the joy of the Lord is your strength. Say it with me again. The joy of the Lord is my? The? Say it. Right on. Okay. And what we see, and we'll throw it up here, Nehemiah 8, the first three verses, gives us some context. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. Cheryl, take a look at what that word is. The water gate, the sluice gate. <laughs> and they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra, the priest, brought the law before the assembly, both men and women and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. And he read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of the men and women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. In other words, they spent every morning, all morning, just listening to someone read the Bible, read the scripture to them. Hours and hours, all morning until lunchtime. Then we pick it up. Then we come back to our our opening scene. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra, the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the law. In verse 10, our verse, then he said to them, go your way, eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day, is holy to our Lord, and do not be grieved, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. What was Nehemiah telling the people? If this happened today, he would say it this way. I think he would say it this way. People of Israel, don't be sad that it's over. Be happy that it happened. Don't be sad that this season is over. Be happy that it happened, and now a new season is before you. Now, what does this have to do for us today? In this new season, what are we facing? Let me connect the dots. 16 years ago, Pastor Marcia Smith came back to her spiritual home, just like an Ezra, just like a Nehemiah her spiritual family. I only learned about this recently. She was telling me the story. This is where she started. Then she went to Calgary. At first, you know, when we first met, I thought you were from Calgary and then you came here. But no, you were here. You were here when the church started in the basement. You were here at the very beginning. Went to Calgary. I don't know how long you were there for, six years, seven years, seven years. Then she came back. Just like an Ezra and Nehemiah. And like the city of Jerusalem, it was a ministry at that time that desperately needed repair and restoration. And despite the huge challenges facing her and this ministry, Pastor Marcia Smith had the faith and the courage to say, yes, Lord, I will. She dared, <laughs> she dared to ask her king 
for the divine resources to restore this ministry. And her king said, yes. Just like Nehemiah's king. And she began this daunting task of restoring and rebuilding the ministry 16 years ago. And it was your partnership, your partnership together, the par partnership of the people in the marketplace, business owners, business people, people who had jobs, people who didn't have jobs, people that are out there in the world. Sorry, Wayne. I know I'm supposed to stay here, but you know, I'm distracted by my time limit. Oh my gosh. <laughs> okay. But it was, the, it was the partnership. It was the partnership of a spiritual leader along with the marketplace people of this congregation that made the difference. And today, today, Mississauga Victory Church stands financially strong out of debt, paying the bills, and helping people in tangible ways. That is something to be proud of. And something I wanted to make sure in today's message, I wanted to honor Pastor Marcia for the hard work that she did. Because she didn't have an associate pastor. And I'll, I'll, and I'll even say it, you know, the, I'll say the, the, the elephant that's in the room. She was all alone, no associate pastor, no husband. Although maybe the no husband part might have been a benefit, would have been an advantage. You know, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. You know. For this, only for this season, right, Cheryl? There's still another season, Marcia. It's not too late. Not to Pastor Marcia, I'm sorry. <laughs> now, in some future message, probably in a few weeks from now, maybe on the seventh or something, or somewhere after that, I'll tell you the story of like what brought us together. Because something was up, God was up to something because Pastor Marcia moved into our neighborhood right beside us, okay? We're unit 52, 51 is it? And she's unit 51. We're right beside. In other words, if I need to talk to Pastor Marcia, I just knock on the wall. Are you awake? Or I just listen and I can hear if the dog is barking or if she's, you know, if she's, oh, that's, that's Pastor Marcia praying. I can hear her across, from my wall. So somehow God made it so that she would move into our neighborhood right beside us. And 12 years later or so, 11 or 12 years later, she's walking her dog. I'm outside in the front. And for some reason, she asked me this question. After I'd retired how many, six, seven years from pastoral ministry, she goes, Mark, would you be open to coming back into ministry? And it just so happened at that moment that the Lord had been working on me since the, earlier that summer to be open. I said, as a matter of fact, let's talk. And we did. Now, when all of this was decided, and I said, okay, let's, let's see what we're going to do. I did my own. Are you familiar with a SWOT analysis? Do you know what a SWOT analysis is? SWOT stands for uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. So all these years... Pastor Marcia has been inviting me I, about probably three or four times a year, I think, where, I, where I've been able to speak here at, uh, and preach here at MVC. So I'm looking into that, plus everything that I'm hearing from people, from Pastor Marcia and from other pastors and all that kind of stuff, the history. And I do a SWOT analysis of my own to help me understand the situation that I might find myself in. So I want to share with you a part of that. Analysis. I'm going to share with you the strengths that I think MVC has. And I'm going to share with you the threats that I think that faces us as a spiritual family. I think, first of all, the one strength I've already mentioned, you know, we, it's amazing. But Pastor Mercy was able to lead this church out of debt and into the black. We're not in the red. Praise God. We're financially strong, meaning we're, we have a, a positive cash flow. We we have no debt, outstanding debts, except for, you know, our monthly lease and, and utilities and that kind of thing. That's an amazing thing. Okay, that's an amazing thing. What I also find amazing, and my wife as well, is that one, another strength that we have here is that everyone here, it seems, everyone that we've been able to witness and see week by week um, 
is engaged in serving the Lord. There is a spirit of servanthood that has been embedded into the culture of MVC. This is awesome. Very awesome. Generally speaking, you know, the Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule usually happens. It usually means that 20% of the people in the congregation do 80% of the work. 20% of the people give, the, give for the income of the church, while 80% don't really give that much. You know, 20% tithe, the other 80% leaves a tip for God. Okay? Not here. It's the other way around, apparently. Amazing. You guys are amazing. And yeah, that's your strength. We have a large, look at this, we have a large and equipped facility. The technology's here. So I want you to look around. I want you to look around first. Take a look. Take a look at the back. See the guys in the back. The, we have that amazing audio board. We have, you know, projectors. We have sound system. We have storage space. Amazing. But I want you to say this. I want you to look around and say this. This is not the church. Say it again. This is not the church. These things are good, but they're not the church. You are the church. The person sitting beside you, your church. We are church, okay? But our strength is the church has a facility, right, that can be used strategically for the community and for the activities. Now, what else? Well, I don't think anyone will argue that over the past 16 years, MVC has had a strong pulpit and a strong confidence in the Word of God. Amen? That's awesome. That's a great strength to have. Okay? There is a famine for the word of God in this nation. And you are blessed, you and I are blessed to be in a church that preaches the word and believes in the infallible, inerrant word of God in the scriptures. Okay? You know what else we have as a strength? We have legacy members. You know, who leg you know what legacy members are? These are people like Jules. These are people like the Mondays who never left. People like Tracy, the Williams. Who never left, despite the problems in the past, they stayed faithful. And these are these legacy people, they're an honor to serve with. They're an honor to be part of this spiritual family. What I discovered, another strength that Embassy has, which was an, a wonderful, wonderful discovery, is that the leadership of of this ministry has a desire to be culturally diverse. Amazing. That's amazing. To be honest with you, when I go, when I go visit, I get most of the invitations I get to preach are from Filipino churches because I spent 15 years in the Philippines. And of course, my ethnic background is there. So my connections are there and they invite me and I get to speak anniversaries and stuff like that, special events. But you know what I see? You know what I see when I look out from a Filipino pulpit? All Filipinos. And I always give them a hard time. I give them a hard time. And if you're watching this on Zoom, if you're a Filipino, listen to my words. This is what I say to them. I said, why did you come to Canada? I say this, especially to the pastor. I say this. Why did you come to Canada? Oh, because, you know, we want to make disciples. Who are you making disciples of? Filipinos. Why here? Why is it that you, come, you travel thousands of miles by plane, you move everything, you uproot your family, you come here, and when you get here to Canada, a whole different country, what do you do? You eat Filipino food. You watch Filipino TV shows. You make Filipino friends. You talk in your Filipino language and dialect. And you, you do everything Filipino. And then you say, we want to reach the Philippines. You know what? There are more Filipinos in the Philippines than there are in Canada. You should have stayed in the Philippines. And I give them a hard time. Oh, my gosh. I tell, you know what else I tell them? Guys, put aside the rice and try some poutine. You're in Canada now. Okay, you're in Canada now. Have some poutine. Okay? Have some Montreal smoked meat. Something Canadian. Come on. And I really do that. I really do that. But I discovered here... One of the first things that was said to me from the leadership was, we don't want to, we want to be culture diverse. We don't want to be just, and, you know, I've said this before, and there was no negativity when I said this. I thought it was really cool because all these years when Pastor Marcy invited me here, I always thought 
Victory churches, the whole, all of the victory churches are black churches. Why? Because every time I come here, everybody, hello, hello. So that's an assumption. That's a proper assumption, right? Until she introduced me to, to Dr. George and Hazel. And first thing I said, I thank God my mic was on mute. I said, holy crap, they're white. I'm like, oh, wow. And you know what? They reminded me so much of my, my grandparents. It was like, wow, what a connection. It was amazing. But I was so surprised. But I was so happy. Because, guys, think of this. Think of this. I don't know if you've even thought of this. You know that I'm not black, right? You do know that, right? <laughs> Just want to make sure. Just want to make sure you know what you're getting into. But I thought it's so cool. A congregation who easily can be tempted to aim for one cultural target market decides, no, we don't want to get people who are just like us. We want other people. We want to reach as many Canadians as possible. I am so, you don't know how proud I am to be a part of a ministry like that. Amazing. Yeah, give yourselves a hand. Uh, really. And then lastly, the last strength. I think it's not the only strength, but what I could think of. Was pro it's probably the greatest strength that we have here at NBC. And that is this unequivocal belief, strong belief in prayer. It's in your DNA to reach out to God, to cry out to God for a breakthrough, to, to seek after him with all your heart. And that is amazing. Almost even more than being proud of wanting to be culture diverse is this hunger. I'm proud to be part of a family that is hungry for God's presence and power and his will in our lives. And that's our strength. And we should celebrate that. And a lot of that, I have to say, I attribute a lot of that to the leadership of Pastor Marcia Smith. Praise God for her, for her life. Now, let's go to the threats. What threatens our existence? What is it that we have to be careful about? Okay. Number one. Number one, I think, is the misuse of our capital. We have to be very careful. We have to be very good stewards of the finances that the Lord has blessed us with. Because we're certainly not rolling in the dough. You know, we're not yet at the place where, where Pastor Marcia read that passage in Genesis. You know, extremely wealthy. We're not there yet. Okay? Nuff, nuff is where we're at. Right? Um, and it's good. That, praise God for that, right? Praise God for that. But we can never take God's blessings for granted. So we have to be careful stewards. That I'm so happy that we have people on the board, and you'll see later on who are, who are wow, they are vigilant when it comes to our finances. And you'll see how well the ministry has managed our finances over the past 16 years. Um, the other threat that we have, as you know, we have other ministries that rent this place. So before us, there's a church called Cross of Life. You probably see the sign when you walk in. I met the pastor for the first time, Pastor Caleb, for the first time. Turns out we both grew up in Orleans in Ottawa. So we know, you know some similar places there. That was good to connect with him. And they have, you know, they have this certain days. They have this Sunday mornings that we come in at 1230. They're supposed to be done at 12 so we can come in and set up. But on Saturdays, we also have the Ebenezer Seventh-day Adventist Church that is here on Saturdays. I met them. I bumped into them uh, while they were having their Bible study in the afternoon. They're here all day on Saturday. And if we lose those two tenants, the, the weight of the monthly rental cost of this place will be overwhelming for us. So that is a threat. We have to... Make nice with them. We have to make sure we keep that. Of course, we're not going to, you know, we're not going to compromise any values. But at the same time, we have to make sure that they're happy and that they, they pay the rent so that we'll be able to do that. 
But that's something that we have to watch out for. Imagine if we can turn that around. Imagine if we ended up having three or four services because this place is packed and we don't need tenants anymore because we have a bigger base or even better. We grow so much, we have enough money to have our own building, right? Amen. Maybe this is the season for that. Who knows? The last two threats are the one to me the most important or the most, we have to watch out the most, the, most, the biggest threat. One is maintaining the status quo. This is going to be a great temptation for us. Because when you maintain the status quo, it means that you remain in survival mode, which is what you had to do for these past several years, right? For a decade or so, because you needed to survive. But staying in survival mode is a threat to the potential of this ministry of Mississauga Victory Church. Um, we can't stay in survival mode. I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. On the other, the flip side of the coin is this. The other threat is attempting to bring back the good old days. That's a big temptation. Oh, remember when it, we did this? Remember when we had this? Remember that prayer meeting when we used to have those things? We had that. You know, when you start looking backwards at the best days of your life as a ministry, you've already started digging in the grave. And we can't afford to do that. We need to keep looking forward. Amen. Are you hearing what I'm saying? We need to look forward. We can't look backwards. Take a look. When you go in your car, what's bigger, your windshield or your rearview mirror? Your windshield is bigger because it's more important to look forward than it is to look backwards. You do need to look backwards. You need to learn where you come from, but you need to be obsessed with moving forward to get where God wants us to be. So let's try to fight the temptation of bringing back the good old days. Now, survival mode. We cannot remain in survival mode because if we do, the enemy will have us exactly where he wants us. In survival mode, we're useless for the kingdom. In survival mode, we pose no threat to the enemy. In survival mode, we are not thriving. We're just surviving. So we have to get out of survival mode. We have to move forward in survival mode. So we... we we put the past behind, but we embrace what's coming up. We embrace the future. How do we do that? The joy of the Lord is my? Yes. This is how we face the future. This is how we move from one chapter to the next. The joy of the Lord is my strength. These words were said when the Jews were facing the closing of one season and the start of a new season. So let them be the words that you hear in your heart today as we witness the end of one season and the beginning of our new season. Say it again with me. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Now the new season will be different. Okay, so I look at the clock and I see 140. That's what I see. Don't argue with the man of God. He sees visions. Okay. No. I'll, I'll almost be done. The new season will be different, but it will build on what was accomplished in the old season. Okay? It's not that we turn our backs on the old season. In fact, we build on it. The new season, and I want you to say this with me, the new season is about sentness. Say sentness. Sentness. So we need to catch Jesus' vision of being sent into the marketplace, sent into the offices, sent into business, sent into the real estate uh, spaces, into the retail spaces, sent into clinics, sent to the campus. And what does this mean? So I'm going to give you a, a little bit, okay? So for, for a few more minutes, I'm just going to give you a glimpse of what I mean by sentness. We need to start thinking about sentness this way. Let's understand sentness in four ways. Number one, sentness releases abilities. Sentness releases abilities. Why? Because you and I, we have undiscovered gifts. We have abilities in us that are yet to be used for the kingdom of God. 
and is sitting inside of you. If you go to a cemetery, you drive around and you, you pass by a cemetery, a lot of potential was buried in that cemetery. And it cannot be taken out anymore. There are treasures, potential treasures that are in those caskets and under those headstones because they no longer have the opportunity to develop that potential and to develop those abilities and those gifts. You have these undiscovered gifts in you or you may have underutilized gifts. Maybe you have gifts you know you have, but they're not being used. They're being wasted. I remember a friend of mine who was telling me, I, I used to, there was a year where I worked, I worked anywhere. I was so desperate, I worked anything. I worked warehouses most of the time. I even, you know, I even, have you ever heard of the show, of the, the online store called Zara? Have you heard of Zara? It's a women's clothing place, right? Zara.com. I used to work for Zara. You know what I used to do? I used to work in their warehouse just over here in Milton. And what, the, what, they, what they did is what I did I was injured. I couldn't lift anything. I said, I can't lift anything heavy, so please get me doing something that's not heavy. Guess what I did? I folded women's clothes. I sat at a big table, huge table, with a bunch of other, about two, three, four dozen other women around, had their own tables. Clothing would be rolled up to us, and we would fold that and do that, put it in a box and ship it. If you ordered it, I'll pack it, put it in a box, seal it, ship it out. I learned to fold the weirdest clothing. Women's clothing is just weird. It's weird. Men's clothing is symmetrical. Left side is the same as the right side. Women's clothing, it's like angled like that. What, how do you do that? I remember, I remember one time, I, I, I was, a, a skirt came to my table and the skirt was about this size. I said, ladies, how do you wear this skirt? Where do you put it on? I said, my gosh, it's not, not any bigger than my wallet. Oh, my. Oh, my. Not good. But I, I didn't know I had underutilized skill in me, and I learned how to <laughs> do that. But my friend used to tell me, she said, Mark, you're not supposed to be there. What are you doing? What are you doing at that warehouse? What are you doing at that, at that uh, folding clothes? That's not you. You have more potential than that. And, for the whole year, she kept telling me this until I finally said, that's it, I'm done at the end of the year. And I went into business instead. Some of you have underutilized abilities. Or it may simply be that you have undeveloped skills. Skills that are there, but you haven't developed it. and haven't. They need to be honed and released for the kingdom. Sentness releases abilities. Secondly, sentness dispatches assignments. Do you know your assignment? At the heart of sentness is the assignment you've been given by the Lord to make a difference for his kingdom. After Easter, which is in three weeks, after Easter, I'm going to do a series called My Life on Purpose. And my hope is that through that series, you will discover how God made you and what your assignment is for this season. At the Sentness also not only dispatches assignments. Third, sentness provides authority. When God gives you an assignment, a task to accomplish, he gives you the authority, the right to do that task. And with that authority comes confidence to do that task. And then lastly, number four, sentness requires availability. Availability. Sentness requires availability or an openness to be equipped for the task, to develop what's necessary to succeed. We must be available, not only for training, but to build friendships to build family, to build fellowship. So we need to spend more time together eating the fat and drinking the sweet. Hallelujah. The season of Ezra and Nehemiah was successful. And now it's time to build on what they worked so hard to accomplish. Their assignment is complete. It's now time to take on our assignment for this new season. And no matter what we may face, we will say together, the, of the, say it again with me, the joy of the Lord is my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength, the joy of the Lord is my strength. Amen. Let's walk into the future together. Amen. Amen.
Let's stand and let's close in prayer. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for the faithfulness of Pastor Marcia. Thank you for her open heart to be led by your spirit. Thank you for her faithful obedience over these many years. We're grateful for what she has laid down as a platform for the future of this ministry. We honor her, oh Lord. We bless her. We pray for an open heaven over her life and over her ministry, Lord. We pray, Lord God, for your goodness to follow her all the days of her life. And I thank you for this spiritual family. Thank you for Mississauga Victory Church. Thank you for the people here who partnered with Pastor Marcia to rebuild and to restore. I pray that you would honor and bless their faithfulness, oh Lord God. And I pray, Lord God, as they stay to move forward together, Lord, that you would, you would bless them. You would bless them, Lord, in every way, relationally, financially, professionally, Lord, maritally, family-wise, Lord God, in every way. Bless them, oh Lord. Grant us favor, Lord, favor in the name of Jesus. We thank you for that favor and for that grace. Holy Spirit, lead us and guide us. And even as we prepare for this AGM, Lord God, give us wisdom to be efficient and effective in all that we do so we would continue to be fruitful for you, Lord, in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen. God bless you. Take a break for a bit before? Yeah. Let's take a bathroom break or so before we meet for the AGM.